Hello and welcome to my new video. Um, today's video is a combination of three videos I made within the last five, six months uh, about the subject of conspiracy theories. I have separated those three videos into four parts and a conclusion for this video. Um, there will be a few, a few moments where you'll see me repeat certain conceptions or re-explain certain conceptions. That's just because of the fact that the original videos were separate. So I had to re-explain the conceptions. And uh, yeah, other than that, I'm really happy to be able to move on to the next subject. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy this video. According to American political scientist Michael Bakun, there are three distinct features of conspiracy theories, which he also calls conspiracy beliefs, that can be illustrated by the following statements. Nothing is as it seems, everything is connected, and nothing happens by accident. He argues that it is the combination of these assumptions that define the particular narratives of conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy beliefs assume a certain intent behind all events. Things that happen, quote, have been willed. There is no space for coincidence or randomness. Moreover, similarly to the X-Files catchphrase, trust no one, the way the world appears is not how it actually is within conspiracy beliefs. Therefore, conspiracy beliefs hold strong skepticism towards the ways things appear. Lastly, there is an overarching way of things being interconnected and related to one another. Connections are drawn everywhere. Everything can be linked to everything. The worldview of the conspiracy believer is defined by the dualism of good and evil and light and dark. Moreover, it portrays a world of meaning and purpose. We will come back to this aspect in the second part of the video. A different definition of conspiracy theories comes from German political scientist Armin Fahl Traugba. He defines conspiracy theories, which he calls conspiracy ideologies or myths, by their distinction from what he calls a conspiracy hypothesis. A conspiracy hypothesis is a belief about a conspiracy taking place that is not immune against evidence that doesn't promote the conspiracy theory. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say I believe that my friends are planning a plot against me because I catch them whispering behind my back again and again. Then on my birthday, they suddenly surprise me with a birthday party and tell me that what I perceived as plotting against me was actually them planning the party for me. If my belief of them plotting against me was a conspiracy hypothesis, I would at this point be learned better and move on with my life. On the contrary, if my belief would be a conspiracy ideology or a conspiracy myth, I would not believe the evidence they provided about the birthday party. Instead, I may actually believe that the party is a part of a larger plot against me and is just a way of distracting me and making me believe that everything is okay while their master plan is successfully unraveling. For this reason, Traugba calls conspiracy ideologies monocausal, because they only accept assumptions that promote their self-evidence, while a conspiracy hypothesis acknowledges the possibility of being false. We can see that in accordance to Barkin's definition, this definition also holds certain presumptions about how conspiracy theorists think. In contrast to these definitions, the definition of conspiracy theories within the sociology of knowledge states that there is nothing particularly different about the way conspiracy theorists think. According to this definition, conspiracy theories are just another form of knowledge that people apply while trying to understand the world around them. Conspiracy theories then are good explanations for collective events that otherwise cannot be explained coherently. Other types of explanations simply aren't as comprehensible as conspiracy theories. This theoretical approach usually follows the conception of knowledge that was developed by Luckman and Berger in their famous work, The Social Construction of Reality. Knowledge within this conception is always socially transmitted. Therefore, the availability of information is an important factor for acquiring knowledge. The medial possibilities of communication that are made available through the internet provide a new platform of knowledge that creates an alternative public source for knowledge to the traditional mainstream media. Within the internet, there is no distinction between producer and consumer anymore. Everybody can be a producer of knowledge. Therefore, it provides a knowledge supply with theoretically infinite interpretations of truth. Through acquiring knowledge, we can make sense of something that might appear abstract, paradox or incomplete otherwise, especially when the medial display of occurring events make their content seem complex, unexpected or inexplicable. Conspiracy theories can provide more coherent and holistic explanations of these events.
Cultural scientist Mark Fenster characterizes conspiracy theories with the notion of cognitive mapping based on the theoretical conception by Frederick Jameson. The notion refers to the ideological process through which individuals situate their own position within a seemingly transcendental and abstract social space and fill knowledge gaps by constructing a coherent narrative around the abstract reality they perceive. This can be illustrated by looking at the Bilderberg meetings, which again and again proved to be an ideal source of speculation for conspiracy theorists. The Bilderberg group consists of different people, including political leaders and academic experts of different kinds. The annual meetings of these people where the group discusses different political topics are very secretive and therefore leave a lot of room for speculation. The provided public information about these meetings pretty much only consists of the fact that certain influential people meet up, while there is a relatively low amount of information as to why they meet and what they talk about in these meetings. We are therefore dealing with abstract and incomplete information. If there is already suspicion towards politicians and powerful people, it is not that far anymore to fill these knowledge gaps with ideas about shifty activities taking place. But why would people develop such suspicion towards influential politicians? Within the sociology of knowledge, a collective suspicion can arise as a direct result of having knowledge about actual political conspiracies or scams that have actually taken place. The Watergate scandal or the fraud grounds about weapons of mass destruction that the Bush administration used to justify the Iraq war are conspiracy-like activities that actually took place. This seems to be a justified reason for suspicion. But there is another reason for why certain people could develop feelings of suspicion towards a powerful political system. It is the feelings of fear, injustice and estrangement that people experience that can be illustrated by the notion of political alienation. Within this explanation, the motivation of conspiracy theorists can be traced back to the suffering that certain societal groups of people experience. Conspiracy theories then are a way to explain these experiences of suffering in a meaningful manner. A conspiracy theory offers a narrative in which the suffering is shifted into blame towards a group of people that thereby can be held responsible for the injustice that is being experienced. A different branch of theoretical explanations for why people believe in conspiracy theories states that there is a particular personality type that is more susceptible towards conspiratorial narratives. Within these conceptions, certain people share certain psychological traits that make them more likely to fall for conspiracy theories than other people. In contrast to the idea within the sociology of knowledge about conspiracy theories being just another form of knowledge, here conspiracy theories are appealing to certain people because of their particular explanatory quality. This theoretical tradition can be traced back to the studies of members of the Frankfurt School about the authoritarian personality. Critical theorists Erich Fromm and Theodor V. Adorno developed the model of authoritarian characters who are more susceptible to fascist ideology due to a particular destructive development of their psychological needs. Adorno writes, The political, economic and social convictions of an individual often form a broad and coherent pattern as if bound together by a mentality or spirit, and this pattern is an expression of deep-lying trends in his personality. This psychological structure is defined by an ambivalent emotional pattern that can be identified by affects of submission, power, destructiveness, aggression and superstition. Therefore, certain needs within personalities are more likely to correlate with particular ideological contents. That doesn't mean that they are always necessarily stuck together, but more that certain personalities are more likely to believe in certain ideas. Due to the way they were socialized and their needs developed, these people are more receptive towards certain beliefs. Since Adorno came from a psychoanalytical tradition, he believed that the most important source of origin of these personality traits can be traced back to the environmental influence of the early childhood years of human socialization. Therefore, it is usually the family which will have the strongest impact whether or not someone will develop authoritarian personality traits. The way the family operates, on the other hand, is embedded in the socioeconomic conditions of a society. The study about the authoritarian personality that was published in 1950 had a strong empirical ambition in combining quantitative and qualitative methods such as interviews and statistics. The basic conclusion of the study was that people that grow up under authoritarian familial circumstances will develop similar personality traits in which such subjects search for similar patterns of submission and domination. Authoritarian ideologies therefore appeal to such subjects due to their uniform, unambiguous and dominant explanatory nature. 
Accordingly, conspiracy theories offer simple explanations in which it's always clear who are the good people and who are the evil forces that try to take everything that the good side values. Adorno's conception of the authoritarian personality opens the possibility that certain personalities could be inherently pathological. From this point of view, conspiracy theories would therefore appear as a kind of collective disorder. Similarly, American historian Richard Hofstetter later described conspiratorial thinking as the paranoid style in his famous essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. This way of thinking is defined by the feeling of persecution that believers share. The paranoid style is defined by its mystification of certain external forces that want to or already are controlling the fates of humanity. Hofstetter writes, the distinguishing thing about the paranoid style is not that its exponents see conspiracies or plots here and there in history, but that they regard a vast or gigantic conspiracy as the motive force in historical events. History is a conspiracy set in motion by demonic forces of almost transcendent power and what is felt to be needed to defeat it is not the usual methods of political give and take but an all-out crusade. Unlike the rest of us, the enemy is not caught in the toils of the vast mechanism of history, himself a victim of his past, his desires, his limitations. He is a free, active, demonic agent. He wills, indeed he manufactures the mechanism of history himself or deflects the normal course of history in an evil way. American philosopher Brian Keeley defined conspiracy theories by what he calls pervasive skepticism. An attitude of pervasive skepticism is defined by the fact that any external evidence against the belief of the pervasive skepticist will be interpreted as evidence in support of given belief. As with the example of the birthday party I talked about before, it would make me a pervasive skepticist if I'm not convinced that my friends were planning a birthday party for me all the time despite the fact that I have the evidence which is the actual party happening right in front of my eyes. According to Keeley, such an attitude can help people to project meaning into a seemingly meaningless or scary world. It brings control into a world that seems to be random and cold. Keeley's description depicts conspiracy theories as knowledge of an almost pseudo-religious purpose here. He writes, The conspiratorial worldview offers us the comfort of knowing that while tragic events occur, they at least occur for a reason, and that the greater the event, the greater and more significant the reason. Our contemporary worldview, which the conspiracy theorist refuses to accept, is one in which nobody is in control. When the World Trade Center was attacked by Al-Qaeda terrorists on the 11th September 2001, there was a collective need for coping with these events. If a conspiracy of any kind is taking place, it provides a feeling that someone is in control, even if those people are evil willed. The idea that the American government or certain people knew what they were doing still offers a form of comfort by picturing a world in which certain forces have control over what is happening as opposed to being surrendered to random forces. This explanation would support the assumption that conspiracy theories are more likely to occur within certain social circumstances. German political scientist Armin Faltrockba accordingly writes that conspiracy theories are more probable within historical events of change and crisis where explanations for the occurring events are required. Moreover, Traugba writes that they can function as a constituent factor of identity. They provide a framework of ideas into which people can integrate themselves and be part of a solidary group that does the right thing together, fighting against evil forces or people. But this doesn't come without its cost. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories were responsible for the justification of the Holocaust, one of the biggest genocides in history, unique in its calculated violence. So there are several different critical cases that are made against conspiracy theories. The first type of critique I want to talk about revolves around the assumption of a problematic ideological influence of conspiracy theories, which often include narratives of racist and anti-Semitic content that depict a worldview in which there is always a clear enemy, which is usually a particular group of people that is demonized by the conspiracy theorists. It was, after all, a conspiracy theory that justified one of the biggest genocides of human history, which was the systematic extinction of around 6 million European Jews between 1941 and 1945. The roots of modern anti-Semitism can be traced back to the Middle Ages, where Jewish people were accused of holding secret meetings in which they conspired to poison the wells from which people would get their drinking water. This explanation was even more successful due to the fact that there was no conception of germs in the Middle Ages, while the possibility of poisoning someone was well understood. 
Therefore, deaths that were actually related to the Black Plague were pushed on the Jews. The well poisoning conspiracy theory led to the violent persecution of Jewish communities between the years 1348 to 1351. While the massacres would eventually stop with the waning of the Black Plague, the negative perceptions of Jewish communities remain until this day. The anti-Semitism of the 20th century was embedded in a particular type of conspiracy theory that was fed by narratives such as those within the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This fabricated document supposedly contains the transcript of a speech of an unknown Jewish leader in which he reveals a conspiracy plotted by Jews and Freemasons against the rest of the world. While any evidence on their authenticity has never been found, they still found many believers. The origin of this document, which first appeared in the year 1903 in Russia, is unknown. It is possible that this anonymity was helpful in reinforcing the skepticism of people that believed in their authenticity. The popularity of this document only really began after the First World War, when they provided a simple explanation within complicated and difficult times of societal change in the early 1920s related to the collapse of monarchy and economical crisis. The documents were translated into several languages and began their march around the world. In England, the Times Magazine printed them, and in the USA, anti-Semite Henry Ford published them in his own newspaper. In his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf Hitler himself wrote that he is convinced that these documents must be real due to the fact that the Frankfurter Zeitung, a German newspaper outlet, says that they are based on a forgery. The protocols later became a strong propaganda tool for the Nazi party. The Nazis printed and spread hundreds of thousands of copies of them and they were taught in German classrooms and within the Hitler Youth. Well, I guess after such horrific events, it is unthinkable that humans wouldn't be extremely suspicious of the protocols by now and be well enlightened enough about their dangerous influence, right? Well, quite honestly, the protocols of Zion are more popular than ever. The Christian Patriots, the White Aryans, the Jew Watchers, the Nation of Islam, the Palestine Liberation Organization, esoteric followers of the New Age, Orthodox Russian churches, communists who switched out the class enemy with the world conspiring Jew, masses of online conspiracy theorists all refer to this inherently anti-Semitic document. Another ideological branch of racist and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories stems from esoteric occultism. One of the earliest roots of this theoretical tradition are the writings of Russian occultist Helena Blavatsky. In one of her main works, The Secret Doctrine, from 1888, she claims that the Aryans are part of ancient civilizations that have become degenerated while being mixed up with other animal-like races. Some of the Aryans were able to build groups in different parts of the world though, keeping the Aryan race clean. The holy sign of these groups was the swastika. In her work, Blavatsky describes Africans as imbecile, while she states that Jews and Arabs are mentally degenerated. Later, occultists Guido von Liszt and Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels connected Blavatsky's ideas to the Germanic mythology. Hitler was directly inspired by both of them. Liszt claimed the Germanic race needed a strong leader, which Hitler saw himself as. Von Liebenfels, on the other hand, claimed the idea of a blonde heroic race, which the Nazis later adapted. But just as the influence of the protocols, esoteric anti-Semitic conspiracy theories didn't vanish. In Germany, the most popular modern example of esoteric right-wing conspiracy theories are probably the writings of Jan Udo Holly, who wrote the book Geheimgesellschaften, released under his pseudonym Jan van Helsing, which can be translated into secret societies. The book talks about some of the most popular conspiracy theories in which secret societies such as the Freemasons and the Bilderberg Group are plotting since centuries on behalf of the Illuminati. But apart from these conventional narratives, Holly also talks about a conspiracy of rich Jewish rabbis and bankers. He also draws direct connections to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Apart from the Protocols, he also refers to neo-Nazis and Holocaust deniers, such as David Irving and Gemma Rudolf. Around two years after its release, Geheimgesellschaften was confiscated due to a file that was charged by the Jewish community in Mannheim, 
but the book had already gained popularity, having sold around 100,000 legal copies. Apart from that, Hawley continued to release books that haven't been banned, using more subtle ways of promoting his anti-Semitic narratives, such as just talking about conspiring bankers. The trope of the conspiring bankers is very popular among anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, which is why it makes sense to listen well and think twice if someone is talking about bankers who control everything. We shouldn't underestimate how conspiracy theories, due to their often racist and anti-Semitic content, can be incredibly dangerous, having literally justified one of the worst crimes of human history. They hold the potential of dehumanizing people by mystifying them into evil alien forces that try to take over the world and destroy everything that is loved and appreciated by the people that they conspire against. As American historian Richard Hofstadter writes, the central image is that of a vast and sinister conspiracy, a gigantic and yet subtle machinery of influence set in motion to undermine and destroy a way of life. Since the enemy is thought of as being totally evil and totally unappeasable, he must be totally eliminated, if not from the world, at least from the theater of operations to which the paranoid directs his attention. The capability of conspiracy theories to make groups of people, especially minority groups, seem inherently evil, dehumanizes them and opens up possibilities for violence against them. But couldn't we say that there's more harmless conspiracy theories that don't really imply dangerous ideological anti-Semitic or racist ideas? Well, clearly not all conspiracy theories hold racist assumptions or lead back to certain anti-Semitic canards. It should be pointed out that anti-Semitism isn't really the exception within modern popular conspiracy theories. The theory of blood-drinking pedophiles that makes up the core narrative of the most popular conspiracy theories of our time, Pizzagate and QAnon, derives from the classic historical anti-Semitic canard of blood libel, which states that Jews are murdering Christian children to use their blood for ritualistic purposes. Many of the modern UFO conspiracy theories refer to the Zion Protocols or borrow anti-Semitic canards linking them to theories about the superiority of certain ancient alien or spiritual races. Philosopher Karl Popper criticized the tendency of conspiracy theories to shift responsibility for events towards individuals, as opposed to understanding something through more comprehensive explanations, under the term psychologism. Popper says it would be impossible for societal events to always be planned and intended by individuals, but that this is exactly the assumption of conspiracy theorists. He writes, this view of the aims of the social sciences arises, of course, from the mistaken theory that whatever happens in society, especially happenings such as war, unemployment, poverty, shortages, which people as a rule dislike, is the result of direct design by some powerful individuals and groups. While not denying the fact that real conspiracies occur and have occurred, Papa says that real conspiracies are likely to fail. He says that in relation to the complexity of societal events, human action rarely can be as planned and intentional as conspiracy theorists imply. The problem for Papa is not that humans have intentions and that they act upon them. The problem derives because conspiracy theorists explain occurring social phenomenon and events through the individual psychology of groups of people that had everything that occurred willed in the exact way it occurred. There is no room for coincidence or unpredictable social dynamics within conspiracy beliefs. British scientist Peter Knight points out how conspiracies by definition require human agency as a necessary condition. Someone plotting without any intention wouldn't really be plotting. Similarly to the act of conspiring, the idea of a plot involves the necessity of a plan and a plan requires intent. A conspiracy only is a conspiracy if certain people are secretly and willfully controlling certain events. Conspiracy theorists therefore assume that the outcomes of events are planned to a high degree. Knight points out how such a strong notion of human intent is problematic because not all societal events can be traced back to individual intentions. He uses the example of certain patriarchal power relations in which the positions of power that men and women inhabit often aren't conserved because of the conscious intent of men to do so, but rather through subtle and unconscious behavioral patterns and attitudes. 
Conspiracy beliefs underestimate such factors by always explaining societal events as direct causations of human intent. This particularly becomes a problem within the idea of conspiracy beliefs. Conspiracy beliefs aren't just theories about certain singular events that were secretly planned or involve plotting, but instead involve huge plots for world domination and strong connections between different events. As Michael Bakun points out, within conspiracy beliefs, everything is connected and everything was planned. These theories claim a degree of intent and interconnected organization that becomes particularly problematic if we acknowledge the idea that human action and societal events aren't always intentional. Of course this is not to say that certain events can't be planned. It's more about the degree of agency that conspiracy theories often imply. Within conspiracy beliefs, almost every single societal event is explained as part of the conspiracy, which means that all those events must be seen as causations of human intent. This leads me to another point I want to talk about, which is the particular ideological nature of these types of conspiracy beliefs. In the first part, where we talked about reasons as to why people believe in conspiracy theories, I already mentioned the notion of pervasive skepticism that American philosopher Brian Keeley used to describe the particularity of conspiracy beliefs. An attitude of pervasive skepticism is defined by the fact that any external evidence against the belief of the pervasive skepticist will be interpreted as evidence in support of given belief. Now, such an attitude presents the conspiracy believer with a problem. If a belief system is defined by a rigidness which doesn't allow for certain conflicts and paradoxes to be addressed, such a belief system inhabits the characteristics of an ideology. German social philosopher Rahel Yegi defined ideologies as beliefs that are regressive in the sense that they limit the ways certain conflicts or problems can be understood, which makes them an inherently deficitary belief system. In his book Collapse, historian, geographer and anthropologist Jared Diamond discusses the reasons as to why certain societies and cultures fail. Failure or collapse in his definition means a high decrease of the size of the population of such societies. One example Diamond uses to describe such a collapse is the culture of the Greenland Norse, a tribe of Vikings that populated Greenland around the year 980. Within around 400 years, the Viking colony vanished. Diamond sees one of the major factors for the collapse of the Greenland Norse in their cultural behaviors and practices. Unlike the Inuit, that had perfectly adapted their cultural practices towards the Greenlandic climate, the Vikings didn't and instead hung on to practices and traditions that weren't suitable for the environment. This was what ultimately led to their societal collapse. Accordingly, Yegi now defines ideologies as regressive belief systems that prevent certain conflicts that occur from being solved by providing a limited understanding of certain problems and situations. If we apply this to conspiracy theories, the pervasive skepticism similarly limits the possibilities of conspiracy theories to understand certain problems and events. Just like with the non-adaptive practices of the Vikings, a belief system of pervasive skepticism in which every information will always be interpreted in favor of the belief system itself will make it impossible to understand certain conflicts and problems. So the theoretical explanations I have presented so far all pretty much portray conspiracy theories as a deficitary form of knowledge. But there is a different branch of explanations that I've already talked about in the first part, which comes from cultural studies and the sociology of knowledge, standing in the tradition of Foucault's post-structuralism and Luckman and Berger's famous sociological study, the social construction of reality. Contrarily to the theories that depict conspiracy theories as ideologically problematic, there is nothing particularly different with knowledge about conspiracy theories within this perspective. Instead, from this perspective, the question arises why these belief systems are stigmatized in the first place. Accordingly, the whole discourse about conspiracy theories and with that the critique against conspiracy believers is seen as being embedded in certain power relations. Therefore, there is a shift from analyzing why conspiracy theories emerge and why conspiracy theorists believe in them towards questioning the overall discourse itself. Conspiracy theories are seen as a form of heterodox knowledge that doesn't represent the orthodox knowledge that reflects the interests of the leading culture of the political mainstream. 
the term conspiracy theory is used to discredit and devalue this heterodox form of knowledge and stigmatize whoever believes in it. The tone of mainstream media tries to suggest a superior scientific rationality contrasted against the inferior mythologies of conspiracy believers. According to cultural scientist Michael Butter, this hasn't always been this way though. He points out that historically conspiracy theories have usually rather been considered orthodox knowledge. In the 1950s, for example, American presidents Truman and Eisenhower, Senator McCarthy and FBI chef J. Edgar Hoover all believed in anti-communist conspiracy theories, which were also promoted through mainstream media. Historically, conspiracy theories were often very much established knowledge. Buddha writes how within Western culture, this perception of conspiracy theories shifted with the 1960s. Their status as orthodox knowledge decreased and they increasingly shifted away from the public sphere. So it seems that we are dealing with a conflict here. On one hand, we looked at perspectives that condemn conspiracy theories as dangerous and ideological. On the other hand, they appear as just another form of knowledge, while the way they are condemned as myths could appear as a way of keeping a certain power relation intact. When I was reading about conspiracy theories, I was often wondering how the social and emotional experience of the people that believe in these theories looks like. I found many different, often very interesting answers to this question, but many which left me kind of unsatisfied. Let me explain this. In his essay of conspiracy theories, American philosopher Brian Keeley introduces the notion of pervasive skepticism to identify the core psychological pattern of conspiracy believers. An attitude of pervasive skepticism is defined by the fact that any external evidence against the belief of the pervasive skepticist will be interpreted as evidence in support of given belief. That means that the pervasive skepticist won't accept any contrary evidence that goes against their basic belief that a conspiracy is unfolding. In fact, Everything that goes against the belief will rather be ignored or seen as part of the conspiracy. In a similar direction goes the approach of American historian Richard Hofstetter, who identified a paranoid thinking style that is defined by the feeling of persecution that believers share as the root cause for believing in conspiracy theories. According to Hofstetter, conspiracy theorists construct the picture of massive plots that are being carried out by a clear enemy group, which is dehumanized as an almost demonic force that controls everything. While I found these conceptions by Keeley and Hofstetter really helpful in regards to understanding and criticizing conspiracy theories, and also understanding their inherently ideological character, they also left me wondering how such a mental attitude can develop, and what social circumstances could lead up to that. What are the emotional reasons that drive someone to such a degree of mistrust towards public events, where basically nothing could change that attitude? I then found the essay Anxiety and Politics by famous social philosopher and third generation critical theorist Axel Honneth. His essay is a review of another essay with the same name by political scientist Franz Neumann, in which he connects the possibility of the democratic participation of the members of a society to their degree of autonomy. An individual that isn't autonomous, therefore, is not capable of freely appropriating the societal practice of democratic contribution as a rational equivalent. Now, the core concept that Honneth sees within Neumann's approach is that anxiety can undermine the cognitive capabilities of humans, hence disrupting the possibility of autonomous societal participation. The type of anxiety Hunnett talks about here is of a pathological character, in that it paralyzes the individual, preventing the possibility of what Hunnett calls social freedom in his more recent works. Social freedom is the capability of individuals to freely self-realize their own goals in accordance with the goals of a given community, without being obstructed by inner obstacles or constraints. Accordingly, the will of a person that is free in Honneth's definition is complementary to the goals of their social community, meaning that the community can be seen as an objectification of the will of that individual. Honneth writes, Lack of coercion and freedom can not be understood simply as the absence of external force or influence, but must rather signify the lack of inner barriers as well as psychological inhibitions and fears. But this second form of freedom is to be understood, to put it positively, as a form of trust directed inward, which gives individuals basic confidence in both the articulation of their needs and the exercise of their abilities. 
Honnet now says that anxiety is something that can obstruct the possibility of being free in the sense of the word, which as a result can prevent the possibility to freely participate within social contexts. Social interactions will be determined by fear and anxiety as a result. He writes that it is the early childhood years of socialization that set the base ground for the way in which someone will later perceive their environment when they're adults. Children that experience their social environment as a trustworthy social atmosphere, for example, will most likely develop a basic trust towards their social environment when they're adults. Children, on the other hand, that perceive their early social environment as uncertain and uncontrollable, or that experience their early social bonds as fragile, will carry over this basic experience into their adulthood. Now, interestingly, it is the children living under more economically uncertain conditions that will be more likely to have such early childhood experiences of uncertainty and instability, leading them to later perceive the society around them as hostile and not trustworthy. But how is this related to conspiracy theories? Well, in a 1994 study about the social situation of people that believe in conspiracy theories, sociologist Ted Gertzel found correlations of people that believe in conspiracy theories with social alienation, insecurity about employment, being part of a minority group, and lack of interpersonal trust. That means that people that live under circumstances of social uncertainty will be more likely to also believe in conspiracy theories. As we've just seen, children that are socialized under uncertain circumstances can develop a mistrust towards their social environment, which leads them to perceive their social environment as hostile in their adult years. Now, wouldn't this be a very sensible motive for someone to develop thinking patterns such as those that Keeley identified as pervasive skepticism or Hofstadter described as the paranoid style? This leads us back to the theoretical model that critical theorist Adorno and members of the Frankfurt School developed coined by the term the authoritarian personality. It states that such authoritarian personalities develop needs within the early years of socialization that make them more susceptible towards fascist ideologies. The authoritarian personality perceives the world as a dangerous place and yearns for controlled structures, enemy stereotypes and authority. Honnet similarly speaks of the lacking possibility of children that grow up under uncertain and hostile environments and never learn to perceive their social environment as trustworthy. With these findings, we can also make more sense of Hofstadter's idea of the paranoid style. The personality of this type of conspiracy theorist is defined by the experience of mistrust and a lack of control. Foreigners or politicians that are often identified as the enemy within conspiracy narratives consequently can be representations of strange, alien, incomprehensible forces and therefore are very suitable as projections of the anxious mistrust and perceived lack of control that defines this personality type. In her study about alienation, German social philosopher Rahel Yegi, amongst other things, speaks about the possibilities and limitations of individuals to form different interpretations about their situations and be autonomous. Her definition of autonomy strongly resembles Hunnett's definition of social freedom we've talked about before, by the way. Now, according to Yegi, to be autonomous, individuals need to be capable of appropriating the social situations they find themselves in. Similarly to Honnett's conception of social freedom, individuals can feel constrained and obstructed within certain social contexts. Influenced by Charles Taylor's conception of self-interpreting animals, Yegi now says that the capability of rather feeling constrained or free within social situations depends on the possibilities we have to interpret our situations and articulate ourselves within them. Articulation here, by the way, doesn't refer to the capability of formulating something, but rather the capability to mentally comprehend something. I've already dealt with this subject in my video about social roles, so if you're interested in it, you can watch that video. Yegi now writes how our self-accessibility, which is the possibility of interpreting a situation without inner constraints, determines the possibilities we have to see our situation as a situation in which we have agency and therefore be autonomous in a social sense. With that in mind, we can now look at anxiety as an emotion that can obstruct this possibility and by that limit the possibilities of interpreting the social situations we find ourselves in. Yegi identifies this as the subjective possibility to interpret a situation as a situation in which we have agency. Let me simplify this a little bit. 
If I feel anxious or tense and a friend makes a joke that usually would make me laugh, I might interpret that joke as something threatening or as an insult. Now, if I'm socialized under circumstances in which I perceive my social environment as genuinely threatening, this might become something that is essential to my personality and therefore limiting my capabilities of interpreting things as non-threatening. But Diegi also speaks about objective possibilities that can limit such perceptions of situations. We could, for example, say that a social situation in which an individual is dealing with societal and institutional forces that derive from aspects such as social class limit the possibilities of interpreting situations. Certain class struggles, for example, are only known to people within certain economic situations. A single woman with a child, for example, with a low-income job will experience struggles such as not being able to pay for a babysitter, which is something that a single woman with a high economical stability won't experience. Such objective struggles will automatically limit her capabilities to which she is able of interpreting things. That already starts with the fact that there is simply less time to think about certain things, and that even if there is time, the mental freedom to think will be obstructed by things such as the fact that there might be so many other things to worry about for someone that is dealing with certain class-related struggles. Since the subjective and objective capabilities of interpreting, understanding, and comprehending things are limited by such factors, narratives in which conspiracy theorists are stigmatized as intellectually inferior ultimately fall short in their explanatory persuasion. Instead, we should try and understand how collectives exposed to certain influences are led to perceive their social world as hostile, limiting their possibilities of trust towards society. I want to return to Honnet again for a moment to draw attention to another aspect. In his famous study, The Struggle for Recognition, Honnet shows how social collectives share certain experiences of disrespect in which they don't feel recognized. Recognition for Honnet involves experiences through which humans are interpersonally assured that they are safe, worthy, and respected. It is the assurance that the personal expectations that each individual has towards their social environment are met. Honnet draws from the theory of emotions of American philosopher John Dewey to develop his conception of recognition. According to Dewey, emotions have an intentional purpose within the involvement of social activities. They, for example, rather indicate a certain social resonance or a disappointment within contexts of different social expectations. Recognition now involves the satisfaction that comes with the assurance of certain emotional expectations. Honnet, on the other hand, calls the disappointment of these emotional expectations disrespect. He now writes how the disrespect that individuals experience holds the potential for social resistance and rebellion if there is a collective semantic through which these experiences can be explained. Honnet writes, These expectations are internally linked to conditions for the formation of personal identity and that they indicate the social patterns of recognition that allow subjects to know themselves to be both autonomous and individuated beings within their socio-cultural environment. If these normative expectations are disappointed by society, this generates precisely the type of moral experience expressed in cases where subjects feel disrespected. Hurt feelings of this sort can, however, become the motivational basis for collective resistance only if subjects are able to articulate them within an intersubjective framework of interpretation that they can show to be typical for an entire group. In this sense, the emergence of social movements hinges on the existence of a shared semantics that enables personal experiences of disappointment to be interpreted as something affecting not just the individual himself or herself, but also a circle of many other subjects. As long as there is no collective language through which experiences of disrespect can be understood as such, they are solely dealt with privately. There are certain similarities to these ideas within American philosopher Miranda Fricker's idea of a phenomenon she calls epistemic injustice, where the hermeneutical resources of collectives can be limited if interpretative conceptions for certain experienced injustices are lacking. Accordingly, conspiracy theorists would be collectives that experienced some sort of social disappointment or disrespect and that due to their limited interpretative resources can only make sense of their experiences within a collective semantic that is available for them. So is Hanet's conception maybe a way of making sense of social movements such as QAnon? Are individuals within social groups that follow such theories maybe socially disrespected as defined by Hanet?
An interesting case study that can shed some light onto this is the sociological work Strangers in Their Own Land by Arlie Russell Hochschild, in which she tries to understand why a big part of the American citizens is right-leaning and who support political parties that don't act in their favor. In her book, Hochschild introduces the notion of deep stories, which, according to Hochschild, represents an empathetic approach towards understanding the socio-emotional situation of individuals without passing judgment onto them. A deep story involves the emotional history and the reasons why someone feels how they feel and therefore can make us empathize with how it feels to be a certain individual. Hochschild now finds that the deep stories within social groups that are part of the American Red States all share certain similarities. She then says how these individuals came towards believing that at some point the American dream would become true for them when growing up, but how they find themselves in an experienced reality where this vision is constantly disappointed. Hochschild writes, On the one hand, the national ideal and promise at the brow of the hill was the American dream, which is to say progress. On the other hand, it had become hard to progress. The blame for this goes towards the line cutters, immigrants, black people, and so on. What I found particularly interesting here, though, was the fact that we have an exact representation of what Hunnett is talking about when he speaks about the violation of recognition as a situation in which certain emotional expectations that individuals were socialized into are disappointed. The American dream was a narrative into which these people were socialized, and this narrative wasn't fulfilled in their experienced reality. But while this helps us to understand the emotional motives and the social situation of conspiracy theorists, we still have to acknowledge the fact that the grand conspiracy narratives such as QAnon are, well, false, and that conspiracy theories, due to their often racist and anti-Semitic narratives, pose an ideological danger. According to the findings of the previous chapter, conspiracy theories can be understood as an expression of social fear and disrespect towards certain groups of people. If feelings of disrespect and anxiety built the basic emotional attitude that conspiracy believers collectively share towards political and public institutions, and or if the interpretative resources are limited as such we have seen in the previous chapter, conspiracy theories would provide a, a narrative in which the perceived disrespect is acknowledged and made sense of through blame towards a responsible group of people, b, a narrative that is coherent with the perceived experience in which individuals see their social environment as hostile and not trustworthy, c, a narrative through which the experienced anxiety can be compensated, and lastly, d, a narrative that provides a coherent and holistic picture within limited hermeneutical resources and within the abstract social relations of capitalism. Therefore, maybe it is worth it to look at conspiracy theories as less of something that is just irrational and instead understanding them as theories about the world that particularly serve the purpose of making rational sense of the world. Accordingly, conspiracy theories would be critical approaches of individuals to understand the world in accordance to the way that they have experienced it. From this perspective, conspiracy theories can be understood as a form of critique in which individuals try to understand and denounce the injustice and the contradictions of a system that harms them. Unfortunately, though, the content of this critique is misguided and false. Moreover, conspiracy theories can be explanations that try to make sense of contradictory and incomprehensible conditions. From this point of view, it is the experience of the abstractness of the social conditions of capitalism that require an explanatory model that can symbolize this abstract appearance of capitalism. Canadian philosopher Moish Postone used a Marxist vocabulary to show how the Jew with an anti-Semitic conspiracy theories was the ideal personification of the abstractness of the social relations of capitalism. The Jew was not just a representation of capital and money, but of capitalism as a whole in its abstract entirety. The vague and transcendent way that capitalism appeared in the form of financial capital as something alien and abstract was personified by the Jews. Therefore, any dissatisfaction or suffering people experienced related to capitalism was pushed on the Jews as a result. In this context, we can understand conspiracy theories as a type of misguided capitalism critique in which the root cause for some kind of social suffering is misinterpreted or misunderstood. 
this false critique emerges from certain emotional motivations that result from a disappointment of social expectations and or from a class-based social distrust and is limited by certain class-related subjective and objective hermeneutical or interpretative resources that determine the ways in which social phenomenon can be understood. Moreover, conspiracy theories might also be a more accessible form of capitalism critique due to their moral simplicity of good against evil that always makes clear who is responsible, they represent a theoretical tool that most people can easily comprehend without, for example, understanding the complex dynamics of the capitalist economy. The findings I have just presented can lead us to an interesting conclusion. Certain societal dynamics necessarily lead up to the formation of conspiracy theories. That means that conspiracy theories can be seen as a crisis of capitalism, as such that they are systemically written into the capitalist DNA in its current state. If certain social groups perceive their social environment as disrespectful or suspicious as a result of their social status, and if the same groups have limited resources to understand their social situation, the conflict is integral to the system that creates it. If the emergence of conspiracy theories is symptomatic within capitalism, this misguided critique of capitalism becomes a critique of capitalism by itself. In other words, if we don't want conspiracy theories to emerge because they are dangerous or a threat to democracy, we need to criticize those aspects of capitalism that create them. If we want to prevent the political alienation we've been talking about, each individual within a democratic society needs to be capable of autonomous participation within it. As Honnett writes, democratic will formation presupposes a necessary measure of individual autonomy. The readiness to develop social anxiety could be remedied by the possibility of guaranteeing conditions of socialization that afford a great degree of reliability and security in intersubjective relationships. <laughs>